So I'm uh, Bryce Adelstein Lalbeck. Uh, I've been programming in C++ for about a decade. I spent most of my time uh, working in HPC um, and uh, on the C++ programming language. I am the chair of the uh, standard C++ library evolution group. And I do a bunch of other standards related things. I chair the American Committee for Programming Language Standards. Um, and I'm the editor for the uh, American uh, Inclusive Terminology uh, Guidelines and Upcoming Standard. And uh, I do various other standards things. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about parallelism in the C++ uh, 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 standard library. And uh, I work at NVIDIA, where I am an HPC programming models architect. Uh, so I, I sort of shape our strategy for programming models, compilers, and libraries. Uh, I used to be at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And uh, I worked uh, for at the start of my career under Hart McKaiser at Louisiana State University on the uh, HPX uh, parallel runtime. All right, so today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the C++ committee's plan for um, uh, parallelism features. Now, we have a lot of concurrency features already today, but we don't really have any um, uh, parallel programming features with the exception of the parallel algorithms that we introduced in C++ 17. Um, I'm also ta going to talk a bit about um, our, our plans for asynchrony, which are intertwined with our plans for parallelism, and uh, how we're planning on uh, enabling uh, uh, accelerated GPU computing in standard C++. Um, and a good chunk of this talk, I'll also talk about uh, adding some algorithms and uh, data structure primitives that are really frequently uh, needed in uh, parallel programming, uh, mostly related to multidimensional data structures in linear algebra. So um, I like having pretty neat slides. Um, and a lot of namespaces in the standard library are unfortunately lengthy. So here are some conventions that we'll use throughout the talk. Uh, std v is going to be std views. std r is going to be std ranges. ex is going to be std execution. And uh, this thread is going to be std this thread. Uh, it, it, is, it is amusing to me that I have taken on the mantle of my predecessor, Titus, that I now, too, hate the nested namespaces that we have in the standard library. They're just far too long. We should just standardize these names. Um, I will also be making liberal use of class template argument deduction, CTAD, because I really like it. Um, standard C++ has always had support for deducing the template arguments of a template function. But in C++17, we extended this to work for class templates when calling their constructors. So like, for example, when I'm constructing a tuple, I don't need to spell out what the types are. They can be inferred from the arguments. Um, and ditto for like a std array. Um, so y you'll see a lot of this. This isn't typos. This is just to like make the slides simpler and neater. Oh, and I should say, this is C++ now. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them at any point during the talk. Um, and uh, if I feel like it's too much of a tangent, I might tell you to circle back with me towards the end. All right. So the barrier for parallel programming is, uh, is far too high. Um, we live in a world where pretty much all hardware platforms are parallel and require explicit programming to utilize that parallelism. And despite that, many users and many code bases, even today, um, uh, do not utilize parallelism. And for those that do, many uh, have chosen approaches that make that parallelism not portable to GPUs. Um, and that's important because, one, I work at NVIDIA, and I'd like to sell you all GPUs. But two, GPUs are good for you, and they give you a performance uh, boost that you would not otherwise be able to get, especially as we start to see the end of uh, Moore's Law scaling in processor speeds. So the C++ committee wants to build an on-ramp for parallel programming. We want to give users an easy way to um, add parallelism to their code uh, in a way that's going to be portable across multiple different platforms, including GPU accelerated platforms. And we're not aiming to expose all of the capabilities of you know, all the platforms. That we generally don't aim to do that when we're putting portability features into C++. Um, there's always going to be some gap between what you can do with platform-specific interfaces and standard interfaces. Um, but what we want to do is we want to standardize um, a subset that will give you pretty good performance in most cases. All right, so now I want to I talk a little bit about what makes C++ portable. 
Does anybody have any ideas? Feel free to shout them out. Abstract machine, I hear. That's actually kind of correct. I was looking for wrong answers, but that's a correct answer. Yes? There's no such thing as portable language, only a ported language. All right, that was, there's no such thing as a portable language, only a ported language. Anybody else? All right, so I think if we, if we polled people like in the 90s or the early 2000s, we might come up with a list like this. Um, you know, non 8 bit characters, non committal size of, non 2 complements integers, uh, non IEEE floats, non Indian pointers, aligned addressing, segmented memory. Like, this is what, like, historically we think of as being like what makes C and C portable. Um, but the reality is that um, while this was important in the 20th century because there was a lot of divergence between platforms here. Today, we've pretty much settled on you know, one answer for all of these questions. Um, and so most of these things are no longer important. And most of these things are no longer the thing that actually makes C++ portable. So these are not really relevant these days. What does make C++ portable is largely what uh, Jonathan here said, the abstract machine. So the C++ memory model, the C++ execution model, the C++ forward, forward progress guarantees, and our concurrency primitives. And in fact, um, you know, the C++ memory model has become so ubiquitous that it is the, sort of the de facto standard memory model that is used not only for C++, but is the basis for other languages. So this is essentially the new portability contract of C++ in this parallel and concurrent age that we now live in. And we've, we've designed uh, these aspects of the C++ abstract machine in a way that they will, that, the, that the, the, the C++ abstract machine can really execute on any platform from tiny microcontrollers to server CPUs to even now GPUs and other types of accelerators. Now there's two pieces of this contract that are missing and that is um, parallelism primitives and an asynchrony model. And that is what we are focusing on uh, right now in our parallelism efforts on the C++ committee. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I also want to briefly talk a little bit about the nature of the C++ standard. So the C++ standard is descriptive, not prescriptive. It does not prescribe exactly how everything is implemented. It describes instead the structure of C++ source code and the semantics of the abstract machine that executes that source code and the requirements on how that abstract machine is implemented. So the standard specifies enough to be portable and consistent across platforms and domains, but it gives enough freedom for each platform to choose the right design for their implementation and their environment. And that's really, that's really critical. A lot of people uh, tend to get unhappy when they encounter implementation-defined behavior in C++ or undefined behavior in C++ or places where the, the, the standard is perhaps a little vague. But that vagueness is actually often intentional, and it's there for a reason, so that implementers have implementation freedom, and that's really necessary for portability. So we, we call this implementation freedom, and it's an essential aspect of standard C++, and I think many people don't really appreciate the value of this. If we tried to specify everything, and we didn't leave room for implementation freedom, C++ would be less portable, not more portable. And I think that that sort of seems counterintuitive, that if you, if you specify l more, you'd think, well, therefore, it would become more portable. But that would mean that there would be less platforms that could actually implement C++. It would also likely make C++ less performant. So I, I will argue that implementation-defined and undefined behavior are often a feature, not a bug. And uh, as I said in my C++ Now keynote last year, uh, the C++ standard's more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. And that's what allows C++ to be portable and performant on so many platforms and environments. All right, so now let's talk about parallelism in standard C++. So some languages build facilities like parallelism um, into the core language itself. For example, Fortran does this. Um, we don't do that in C++. We, and in fact, in many areas, we tend to prefer a library approach to things in C++. So parallelism in standard C++ is exposed as a library feature. 
Um, that's sort of distinct from concurrency. The abstract machine model, the memory model, the execution model, those are all things that while they have a language, a library exposure, they are actual language features. And there is some sort of core language feature mecha mechanisms behind the library features. But most of what we're going to talk about today is purely library features. And I think I, think I would argue that that's a good thing, um, although that has in some cases backed us into some design corners. No? All right, so there's three pillars to our strategy for parallelism in standard C++. First, we need to have a corpus of common algorithms that can dispatch to vendor-optimized parallel libraries. Second, we need tools to let you write your own generic parallel algorithms that can run on any type of platform or any type of uh, uh, you know, thread pool, GPU, et cetera. And finally, we need mechanisms for composing parallel invocations of algorithms into task graphs. So we're going to cover all three of these pillars today, but we're going to start with the first pillar, the collection of common parallel algorithms. So C++ has had a, a set of serial algorithms for manipulating sequences of objects since the first standard. You know, we're probably all familiar with these. They're in the algorithm header, except for the handful of them that are in the numeric header because history. So these, these algorithms operate on one-dimensional sequences. Initially, they were parameterized with iterators, but with C++20, we've, uh, we've introduced this new abstraction of ranges, um, and we've introduced new range-based versions of these algorithms. For the most part today, we'll be looking at range-based versions of these algorithms. So there's about 100 different of, uh, you know, sequence algorithms. Some of them are just sort of um, variations on a form. Uh, we have some for, for, for for loop abstractions, filters, sorts, searches, rotations, reductions, scans, etc. And then in C++17, we introduced uh, parallel versions of these algorithms, um, these execution policy-based forms here. These parallel overloads have the same interface as their serial counterparts, except they take this extra parameter, the execution policy, and that describes what form of parallelism is allowed, if any. So these execution policies, they describe the how of execution, but they don't specify the where. It just says like, hey, you implementation, you can run this in parallel, like you pick where and how. And, and that means that you know, there's a bunch of different options that an implementation can choose, like you could uh, run it on a CPU thread pool, you could use OpenMP, you could run it on a GPU as our compiler does. And execution policies, they permit parallelism, but they don't require it. So an implementation may choose to not parallelize a particular algorithm, or it may choose to not parallelize a particular invocation. For example, if you call sort on a single element, you know, an implementation may say, you know what, there's, there's no need for me to spin up a thread to do this. Now, all of these uh, execution policy uh, parallel algorithms, they are what I call fork join synchronous. That is, by the time that this call returns, the work will have been done. So when, when uh, the call begins, um, it will spin up some, uh, some work on a thread pool or something, and then it will wait for it to complete before returning to you. Uh, so this means that it's pretty easy to use and to stick into existing synchronous code. But as anybody who has some familiarity with parallel programming knows, synchronous APIs tend to not be great especially if you're dealing with something like GPUs, which have a really long latency for launching work. So there's four different execution policies in the standard now. First, we have std execution seek. Um, now, this indicates that all operations must be performed within the calling thread and must be indeterminately sequenced, which essentially means no parallelism is allowed. Unseek also requires all operations to be performed in the calling thread but it allows those operations to be unsequenced with respect to each other. So that means that your compiler can vectorize, um, but it's not required to, but it can't parallelize. So par allows the implementation to parallelize operations at its discretion. It doesn't re require parallelism again, it's just it allows it. Um, but it also requires that all operations within each thread are indeterminately sequenced, which means that vectorization is not allowed. And then par on seek uh, 
allows operations to occur in multiple threads and to be unsequenced with respect to each other. So this means essentially thread and vector parallelism is allowed. Now again, it's, that's allowed but not required. If you want to learn more about the you know, implications of these four different execution policies and how um, uh, they work, uh, go watch my C++17 parallel algorithms talk from, I think, CppCon, and I'm going to say 2017 because that seems like that would be the right year. 2016, my colleague David tells me. All right, so let me show you one of my favorite. Okay, yeah, we got a question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Can I just go back to the last slide? Yep, I will. Uh, how does the execution seek differ from not passing the execution policy at all? That's a great question. How does stood execution seek differ from not passing the execution policy at all? Well, um, there's a few ways in which the execution policy overloads of the algorithms differ from their sequential counterparts. In a couple cases, like for each, there's a different return type. The parallel for each returns void instead of um, uh, returning you the function object, because obviously a parallel version wouldn't be able to do that. Um, there's a couple other cases like that. Um, the, one of the main differences is the error handling model. So uh, one of the rules of uh, the execution policy overloads is that if any if any exception escapes one of the element access operations, so like an iterator deref dereference or a call of one of the um, callables that you've passed in, if an exception boils out of one of those, instead of it being thrown back to you, the caller, std terminate gets called. There's a variety of reasons for this. I am partially responsible for this somewhat atrocious behavior. Um, but if you wanted to, say, debug your code, um, where some error was happening, you might want to go through the error handling path that the parallel algorithms are going to use, but not actually run it in parallel. And that's one case where you'd want to use std execution seek. You'd then get sequential semantics, but it would be running the same code path for error handling, at least, as the parallel versions. So essentially, I would say it's here for debugging. Another use case might be if, um, generic programming. Um, you know, you might have some, some code that you um, in some cases, want to just like call completely sequentially, and in some cases, you want to call in parallel, and so you just pass in the execution policy as a parameter. Yeah, David. Two, another big one. Um, the requirements on the iterators are different. Right. So David says I, uh, there's a few other differences that I've missed. One of them is that the requirements on the iterators are different for some of the sequential algorithms with the non-execution policy ones versus the execution policy ones. And what's the second difference? Yeah, the ones with execution policies always have to at least be forward. And the second difference? Uh, yes. David points out that in some cases, the, indeterminate, the indeterminately sequenced that you get from std execution seek is uh, weaker than what you'd get with uh, the, the non-execution policy version. So you might get slightly different semantics. Yes, Alfredo. So the question is, could we have required that the callables that be passed into the parallel algorithms be no accept? Um, we, prob we potentially could have. But it's not just the callables that, um, uh, that you have to worry about throwing. It's any of the element access operations. Um, so like an iterator de uh, uh, dereference or increment, et cetera. And that would be a somewhat onerous requirement. We thought it was more reasonable to just call terminate. Um, some may argue with that. It was actually my first committee paper ever was the, was the one that, uh, that introduced these semantics. Yeah. Right. Right. Alfredo was 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 uh, was uh, pointing out that yes, it's not just the callable that's being executed in this parallel context, but there's other operations like some of the iterator operations or say the element copy constructors, etc. And it would be it would be onerous to uh, require all of those to be no except. Okay. Any other questions on this? If not, I'm going to move on to one of my favorite examples, um, which is this parallel word count. All right, so we can write this with a single parallel transform reduce. So transform reduce takes both a transformation operation and a reduction operation. So it applies the transformation to the inputs, 
and then it uses the reduction to sum the results of those transformations. If you're familiar with MapReduce, this is C++'s form of it. So we're going to use the overload of transform reduce that takes two input sequences in a binary transform function. The first input sequence will be the entire string, which in this case is a stanza of my favorite poem, and uh, the except for the last element. And the second input sequence will be the entire string except the first element. So this is sort of like a, um, uh, an adjacent difference types uh, stencil. So this means that our, our binary transform function is going to be passed a window of every two adjacent characters in the string. So our transformation function's job is to tell us whether the two adjacent characters that it's looking at are the beginning of a word. So if the left character is white space and the right character is not white space, then the right character is the beginning of a word. And yes, I know Unicode folks in the audience, I know that this is not Unicode friendly. We're just going to suspend disbelief for the moment. So the pseudo sequence produced by the transformation is going to look like this. For every word, only one and only one of the transformation invocations is going to return true. But what about the first character of the string? We never actually test it with our transformation function. Uh, we start at the second character because of how we've set up this window. So we, we account for that first character in the initial value of the reduction uh, that we pass in here. So that's that little uh, cyan one that we have there. So our reduction operator is just plus. After the transformation, we have a sequence of bools. And summing that up into an int, will give us the count of how many words we have. And there we have a, a very short and elegant parallel word count. So I love this code because it's nice, it's short, it fits on a slide, it's you know portable and parallel. You can run it anywhere on your GPU, on your server CPU, on your laptop, even on your phone. Once uh, Michael Spencer and his friends at Apple get around to uh, uh, implementing the parallel algorithms for uh, Apple platforms. In C++20, um, the standard library introduced ranges. Unlike iterators, ranges are composable. And ranges allow us to express a wide range of algorithms in terms of a few key primitives. And when used in conjunction, the C++20 ranges and the C++17 parallel algorithms are quite powerful. Now, unfortunately, of course, the C++17 parallel algorithms predating ranges are not actually, they don't actually take ranges. Um, but you can build up uh, ranges and then get the begin and end iterator to them and put them into the C++17 parallel algorithms. There's a big asterisk there that there was some, there was a little bug in the standard that actually prevented this from working, but my colleague here, David, has fixed it, and I'm fairly confident that all implementations are going to backport it. So by the time you're seeing this uh, talk on YouTube, it, should, uh, it shouldn't be a concern. So we'll just suspend disbelief. So standard C++ algorithms you know, iterate over sequences of objects, for example, the elements of a container. But sometimes we want to iterate through indices instead of objects. And this is particularly important in numerical and scientific computing. We can do this using IOTA, a range factory that was introduced in C++20. It produces a range of monotonically increasing integers. For example, IOTA 1n will produce all, a range of all integers from 1 to n minus 1. And so instead of passing iterators to elements um, to four each, we can instead pass an iota range. And this will give us a parallel four over indices instead of objects. So this is essentially how you'd write like a parallel four loop in C++20. We can also use parallel algorithms and ranges to iterate multidimensional index spaces. Um, I'm going to say C++23's Cartesian product, but there is some chance it won't make it into C++23, but let's just, let's just think positive fault thoughts. So C++23's Cartesian product range adapter takes multiple input ranges and produces a range of all ordered tuples formed by taking an, in, an element from each input. So we can use this in conjunction with IOTA to create ranges representing multidimensional index spaces. For example, here we use this pattern to write a simple parallel matrix transpose. So the range V here will produce two element tuples from 0, 0 
to n minus 1, m minus 1. The iteration order here is going to be row major, so the second index will be contiguous. We can change to column major by switching the order of Cartesian product. Uh, unfortunately, there's no way to, to switch the, uh, the, the iteration order here that's going to be agnostic to the uh, actual algorithm that you're using under the hood, but that's something that we're hope, hoping we'll be able to work on uh, in future standards. So, yeah, I've got a question. The question is, Cartesian product has a begin and end, yes. Uh, and the question is, are Cartesian product iterators random access? Yes, if the input, if the iterators that, that it's composed from are, if the ranges that it's composed from are. So if you make a Cartesian product from you know, uh, ranges of forward iterators, then it's not going to be random access. But if you make a Cartesian product from, you know, uh, uh, from random access ranges, then it will be random access. Uh, Cartesian product can take, so the question was, is it, does Cartesian product only support taking two uh, uh, ranges? Is it only 2D? No, it can take an arbitrary number. So I didn't hear that one. Does it use modulo and uh, division operations? No, it, it doesn't do that. It doesn't do any flattening of the structure. It gives you back tuples, uh -huh. like right here, yeah. So it's going to give you back the tuples, not um, an index. If you want to flatten down to, 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 a, to a linear index, you'd have to do that yourself. Yeah, yeah, you, you got to do, you got to do, that's, that's an open, that's an open problem. We'll talk more about that later and why certain new data types in C++23 don't have iterators. All right, any other questions on this? Cool. So the C++17 uh, execution policy parallel algorithms, as I've said before, are fork join synchronous. So each invocation launches its work in isolation and blocks until that work completes. So if we have two parallel for each, for each is on the same data block back to back, we're going to get two parallel work launches. And we're going to have to, to block in between them. So it's going to look like this. The caller will be blocked waiting for the first invocation to finish. And only then will the second invocation be queued and launched. And this transfer of control back to the caller is a latency bubble, and it can degrade performance. And it's going to be you know, worse when you're on an accelerator platform when the latency is you know, a bit higher. So one way to address this problem is to fuse the operations together into a single parallel invocation, which can be done with the transform range adapter. So transform takes an input range and a function, and it returns a range that is the result of applying the function to the input. So this is completely lazy. The function is only evaluated as needed when the elements of the returned range are accessed. So for example here, f is not evaluated until the elements of v are accessed in the parallel for each. Now this is a big change in semantics. Previously we had a guarantee that all invocations of f would happen before any invocations of g. And we're no longer going to have such a barrier when we do this sort of transformation. However, in a number of cases, you, that may be perfectly fine. For example, if you're doing two operations that are like completely independent of each other and that are element-wise, then it's probably going to be just fine to fuse them together. Another useful range adapter is filter, which takes an input range and a predicate function and produces a range of all elements of the input for which the predicate returned true. And again, this is done lazily. The predicate isn't evaluated until the elements of the returned range are accessed. So here we use filter in combination with a parallel reduction to sum only the positive elements of a container. All right, so now let me show you some applications that have uh, ported to using the C++17 parallel algorithms. So one of them that uh, is called Lulesh. This is uh, uh, a mini app for Lagrangian explicit hydrodynamics on an unstructured grid. Um, it's sort of a micro benchmark or mini app. It's designed to stress uh, vectorization, parallel overhead, and on-node parallelism. And it's been ported to a number of different parallel programming frameworks like MPI, OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA, Raja, Cocos, and now standard C++. Um, so as you can see here, we, we get some pretty nice results using the same standard C++ code. We can run it uh, in parallel on a CPU using two different compilers and get pretty good numbers there. And we can also take that same code and with the flip of a compiler switch, run it on parallel on a GPU. All right, here's another example, which is uh, STLBM, which is a Lattice Boltzmann framework uh, written from the ground up in standard C++. Uh, 
Uh, and it can run on multi-core CPUs and also GPUs without any code changes. Again, you just change a command line switch. It doesn't use any language extensions or external libraries or vendor-specific code annotations or pre-compilation steps. It's just standard C++ code that can run in parallel on your GPU. And then another one is Maya, which is a code base for uh, aerospace flow and noise simulations, and that's been ported to standard C++. And they're planning to make the move um, from OpenMP to standard C++ going forward. So the C++ parallel algorithms introduced in C++ 17 are a great start, but they're really just a start. Um, uh, you know, they have some limitations, most notably this fork join synchronous behavior that we've talked about. So well, there's two major limitations. Um, so the first is that they're all fork join synchronous. So they launch the parallel work, and then they wait until that work has completed before they return to the caller. Now, where exactly do they launch that parallel work? That's the second problem here, which is that it's like completely left up to the implementation. You have no control or visibility into that. So it happens on some amorphous implementation-defined execution uh, context. It could be a CPU thread pool, it could be a GPU stream, Grand Central Dispatch, Windows Fibers, et cetera. Implementations have complete freedom. Most implementations are going to tell you what the options are and maybe provide a switch. But one of the other issues here is that you have no control over like saying like this uh, parallel algorithm invocation I want to run on my CPU in parallel, and this one I want to run on my GPU in parallel. It's just there's one amorphous execution context for all of these things, and that's where all of the parallel things run. Now, that's not even necessarily how it would have to work. You know, an implementation could internally choose, hey, I'm going to run this on the CPU and this on the GPU. But there's no way for you to say that today. So t today, C++ has no standard model for asynchrony and no standard way to express where things should execute. Yeah. Uh, just jumping back, I guess, to the slide right before that. Yeah. Um, so the x par on c and so on, is that a type that the various algorithms overload on? Like, is that just a tag <coughs> instance? Or is that a runtime value that someone could expose, you know, a, system-level API to give you back your, your options? So, so the question is, what is the, what, what are these execution policy objects that I'm passing in here? So um, each one of these objects is, you know, some inline uh, uh, object that is um, uh, in the execution header. Um, each one has a distinct type. So, you know, par on seek has a different type than par, has a different type than seek. So this is just a singleton to object that you know, uh, everybody passes in. You could you know, construct you know, from the underlying type itself. I'm not sure whether it has like, a, like official constructor. Um, but they, they are like runtime values, but each one has a different type. OK, so you can't do runtime configuration of how, you, how or where things are done. So, the, so you can't do runtime configuration of how or where things run with execution policies today, but that's largely because the execution policies do not say where things execute. They only say how or what is allowed. Um, now, you could imagine in the future having some way of indicating location as well um, and passing it through this parameter. In the past, some proposals have been you know, to do that with like a member function or something. We'll talk a little bit more later about um, uh, what, that, what these various designs may look like. Okay. Any other questions on this? Cool, let's move on. All right, so as I said, today C++ has no standard model for asynchrony and no standard way to express where things should execute. But fortunately, the solution is coming soon to your C++ implementation, although not as soon as I had hoped when I originally made these slides. And that solution is senders and receivers, which is uh, the asynchronous execution framework for the standard C++ library. All right, so let's look at a simple example. OK, so first, we need to get one of these scheduler things. And this, we might get this from a thread pool, or a tasking system, or a GPU driver, et cetera. Then once we have a scheduler, we can start a chain of work on it by calling schedule on that scheduler. And that will return us a sender object. And that sender will complete on the execution context associated with the scheduler. Next, we use a sender algorithm, then, to compose work onto that sender that we got from the scheduler. 
And this work will also be performed on that same execution context. The sender algorithm will return a new sender, which we can use to add more work onto the chain, as we do here with this second then. And then finally, we wait until the chain of work has completed using sync wait, which will return the value sent by the final sender in the chain. Are any questions on this? Yes, right there. So I just want to make sure I understand this right. This is more like a chain of uh, futures than it is like channels. The question is, is this more like a chain of futures than it is channels? I would say this is more like a chain of futures than channels because this is not building up a reusable structure. There is a, um, an idea for um, senders that can send multiple times, um, which would allow you to build up um, these reusable uh, graph structures that you could uh, invoke multiple times, potentially even with different data on. But that is outside of the scope of what we are currently considering for standardization. Yes. Would this model work on MPI? Stay tuned. Any other questions here? Cool. All right, so there are three key concepts in this model. Two of them I've shown you. One of them you, was there, but was behind the scenes. So first, we have schedulers. Schedulers are handles to execution context. And schedulers produce senders. So senders represent asynchronous work that will eventually send a signal. They can be composed together with sender algorithms to form task graphs. And then we have receivers, which are this thing that you didn't see because they're sort of behind the scene. And receivers process asynchronous signals from senders. So we're going to go into each of these three key concepts in, in depth. So we'll start with schedulers. So I said that they're handles to execution context, but what exactly does that mean? Well, an execution context is a resource that represents the place where execution will happen. So this could be a concrete resource like a specific CPU thread pool um, or a GPU uh, stream. Um, it could also be something more abstract like the current thread of execution. And execution contexts don't necessarily have a representation in code. And today, they don't have any exposed interface. They may have some state associated with them, like OS handles, memory, metadata, et cetera. Schedulers represent a strategy for submitting work to execution contexts. They are lightweight, non-owning handles to contexts. They're cheap to construct and pass around. The execution context is supposed to hold all of the state. Multiple schedulers may refer to the same execution contexts, including multiple different kinds of schedulers. For example, you might have two schedulers that submit work to the same execution context, but with a different priority. You might even have a scheduler that dispatches work to multiple different execution contexts. So schedulers produce senders. We use schedulers to produce senders that are going to perform work on the execution context associated with the scheduler. Once we've obtained a sender from a scheduler, we can compose work on it. So now let's look at senders and how we actually compose them. So as I said before, senders represent asynchronous work. They form the nodes of a task graph, which may span multiple schedulers and multiple different execution contexts. Senders are lazy. You must explicitly start them before any work will execute. And when a sender's work completes, it sends a signal to the receivers attached to it. So receivers are handlers that get notified with a signal by a sender. There are three different handling paths, which we call channels. The value channel is used to indicate successful completion and may pass one or more values to the receiver. The error channel indicates that the sender's work failed and passes an error object that contains information about the failure. The done channel is used to indicate that the sender's work was canceled before it could be performed. This is distinct from the error channel because cancellation is not an error. It may happen during the course of normal operations. So each sender notifies its attached receivers with one signal, meaning only one of these channels is invoked. So now let's look at how we actually hook up senders and receivers together. OK, so let's start with a scheduler, which we're going to get a sender from. 
So a receiver is attached to a sender via an operation called connect. This is a behind the scenes operation that you won't normally see if you're like writing a uh, code that uses asynchronous operations. But if you're implementing those asynchronous operations, you might see it. So connect returns something called an operation state, which contains the actual work that the sender represents. Eventually, you initiate work by calling start on the operation state. And after some time, the operation completes and then notifies the receiver with the signal. Any questions thus far? Because we're about to go down the rabbit hole. OK, now let's look at sender composition. We compose senders together using sender algorithms. And there are a few forms of them. The first is sender adapters. Sender adapters take one or more senders as parameters, and they return a sender. Most sender adapters are pipeable, just like range adapters. The semantics are similar to Unix shells. So send pipe f pipe g is the equivalent of g of f of send. Languages like Haskell and APL call this point free style. The primary input argument is not explicitly named. This syntax is essential for elegant composition of senders and for elegant composition of asynchronous code in general. So composing senders via nested function calls becomes a, a mess really quickly. The order in which operations occur is inverted from the order in which they appear in code. The predecessor senders are more deeply nested and thus appear after their ancestors, which is confusing. Things get a bit clearer when we instead use a temporary variable for each stage of composition. However, this is very error prone. It's easy to mix up one of those named variables and pass the wrong thing as the next stage of the pipeline. The pipe syntax gives us a clean way to compose chains of senders in the order that they will be evaluated. Any questions? Yeah. So I don't see any receivers in this example. Is that going to come up? Or? Question is, we don't see any receivers in this code sa sample. Is that going to come up? It's good that you don't see any receivers in the, these code samples. You're basically not in writing code that uses sender-based asynchronous operations, you will not really see receivers. You only really see receivers if you're implementing your own primitives or if you're implementing your own senders. So for the user-facing perspective, mostly you're just dealing with schedulers and senders. For library implementers, you might be working with receivers. Yeah. You are getting ahead of me. We're going to get there in a second there. All right, another question in the back? Nope, cool, going to move on. All right, so now let me show you some of the most important sender adapters. So then takes an invocable f and calls it with the values sent by the prior sender. The sender returned from then will then send the results of the invocation of f. So this is how you attach a continuation to a sender. This is, if, if you're familiar with a lot of C++ future libraries that have a dot then operation, this is that. So bulk is similar to then. It evaluates the invocable once for every index in the shape n. In the simplest and most common case, the indices are one-dimensional and start at zero. And the shape argument is an integer indicating how many invocations to perform. The sender returned from bulk will pass along the signal from the prior sender in the case of successful completion and otherwise an error or cancellation. Transfer changes the scheduler that will be used for the next sender. It doesn't change the scheduler for the prior sender. Some senders can only be connected to a single receiver, for example, because they move any values or errors that they send instead of copying them. We call these one-shot senders. Senders that can be connected multiple times we call multi-shot senders. Split takes any type of sender and returns a multi-shot sender that passes along the signal from the original sender. So split nodes represent forks in a sender task graph. Conversely, winall takes multiple input senders and returns a single aggregate sender that will send the signals from all of the inputs. Senders returned by winall do not have a scheduler associated with them, which means they do not promise where they complete. And that's because it would be 
difficult for us to pick just one of those schedulers from the various input um, uh, senders. So if you want it to complete in a particular place, there's another version of WinAll that, that allows you to specify which scheduler it should complete on. So WinAll senders represent joins in a sender task graph. And WinAll is not a pipeable sender adapter because the partially applied pipeable form would be ambiguous with the fully applied non-pipeable form. So ensure started uh, will connect and start a sender, returning a new sender that will pass the signal sent by the original. If the input sender is a composition containing other senders, then those senders will be connected and started as well. So sender factories are another kind of sender algorithm. They don't take senders as parameters, but they do return a sender. So sender factories are used to start new chains and graphs. They, they are the root nodes of sender graphs. So we've already seen one scheduler factory, or one sender factory, schedule, which returns a sender that completes on the specified scheduler. The return sender doesn't send values or represent any actual work. It's just a handle that you can use to compose work on the scheduler. Just as another sender factory, it takes a set of values and produces a sender that will send those values immediately when it's connected. The last kind of sender algorithms are sender consumers. They take senders but do not return senders. They typically launch a sender graph by connecting and starting it. So these are the leaf nodes of sender graphs. So sync wait is a sender consumer and synchronization primitive that blocks until a sender completes and then returns or throws whatever was sent. The sync wait that you'll see in most of these examples will be in the std thread namespace. This is a concrete form of sync wait that uses a blocking mechanism that is suitable for use in std thread, std threads or the main thread. We imagine in the future that there will be additional forms of sync wait or that it will be a customization point um, because you'd need a different one that would be suitable for fibers, for example. Okay. So now I'm going to show you an example of uh, uh, the details of how sender graphs actually get formed. So let's suppose we have a single link. In, yeah, question, go ahead. The question is, are there, are there plans for um, sort of asynchronous consumers where you don't have to block and wait on the value? Well, if you need to consume something asynchronously, then just add it to the sender graph. I mean, the short answer is, like, perhaps, but if you, if you had, let's imagine that you had some consumer that was asynchronous. Well, if it's asynchronous, then what's it going to return? A sender. And if it takes a sender as an input, and returns a sender, then it is a sender adapter, not a sender consumer. Um, so I, I do see sort of where you're getting, there is actually another sender consumer that is sort of what you want, which is sort of the fire and forget type, um, but it's, uh, it's, uh, its future does not look bright. We're looking at a different mechanism for, for um, uh, those sort of fire and forget semantics, so that's why I've left it off here. All right, moving on. So, sender graph composition. So let's suppose that we have a single link in a chain of senders. We have an abstract, like, before sender adapter on the left-hand side of this link. Then we're going to have a concrete then uh, adapter that's going to, you know, invoke some function f. Then we're going to have an abstract after adapter on the right-hand side. So if we unroll the pipe syntax, we're going to have something like this. We've got a before sender that came from somewhere. We create a then sender, which will contain the before sender and the function f. And we'll also create an after sender, which will contain the then sender. So we're going to end up with a nested structure of senders that's going to look like this. So the, the left-hand side of the pipe is the most nested part of this structure. OK, so at some point, we're going to connect a receiver to the outermost and last sender. Each sender in the nested structure will connect a receiver to its child. This happens in the opposite order of sender construction. So you go down one way, and then you go up the other way. So this is going to give us a nested receiver structure that's the inverse of the sender structure. 
a nested operation state structure is also produced and returned from connect. Eventually, we'll start that operation state. As the operations complete, they'll begin notifying their receivers with signals. When the before receiver gets its signal, it will notify the then receiver. If it's a value signal, the then receiver will invoke F with the value and signal the after receiver with the result of that invocation. Any questions here? All right, now you've seen receivers. We wanted to see receivers before, now we've got some receivers. Okay, so now let's look at a more advanced example, a generic asynchronous and parallel inclusive scan. So we'll write it as a pipeable sender adapter so that it can be composed with other sender algorithms. So sender adapter here is just some wrapper type that magically turns a lambda into a sender adapter object um, because this was the way that I could get the code to fit on the screen. So this, ace, this uh, inclusive scan async is going to take three parameters. A sender, which we will expect to send the input as a range, an initial value, and a number of tiles to split the input into. So we're going to use the classic two-pass parallel scan approach, which requires temporary storage for partial results communicated between tiles. We need to allocate this temporary storage asynchronously once the prior sender has sent us the input. So we'll chain the then sender onto the prior sender that'll do that allocation. In the body of the continuation, we'll create a vector to hold the partial results. We'll return both the input range and the vector. Next, we need to do a first parallel pass, the downsweep pass. We're going to use bulk for this, and that'll invoke the body of the pass for each of the tiles. The first thing we do for each tile is calculate the range of elements that belong to the tile. Then we take all of the elements in each tile, and we perform a local serial inclusive scan on them. And that gives us this. And we do that right here, inside the body of that bulk. So next, we need to propagate information between tiles. The sum of each tile needs to be added to the elements of all preceding tiles. So the communication is going to look like this. We've already computed that sum. It's the last element of each of the local inclusive scans. So we store that result into the partials vector. Assignments to partials from different tiles are going to happen concurrently, but that's fine because each tile uses a different and unique slot in partials, and no one reads from partials yet, so there's no data race. So then after all the tiles have completed their local inclusive scans and written to partials, we need to have one execution agent do a serial inclusive scan of partials. We do this by piping another then sender onto the chain, which will perform the partials inclusive scan. This then sender will again pass along the input sequence and the partials vector. The result of the scan over partials looks like this. And this is exactly the information that each tile needs to add to its elements. Um, and the, or exactly the information that each tile needs to add to its elements is in this, the slot in this vector that's preceding that tile. So now what we need to do is we need to go parallel again and distribute that information to each of the tiles. And this is called the upsweep pass. So we're going to add another bulk here, once again, over all the tiles. In the body of this bulk, we need to calculate which elements belong to the current tile, just as we did in the downsweep pass. And then we use a serial for each to increment each element in the tile by the appropriate value from that partials vector. So after that, we'll have the correct result in each one of the output elements. Finally, we want the sender returned by our asynchronous inclusive scan to only send the input sequence, not the partials vector, which we want to go away now because it's temporary storage and we're done with it. So we add a final then sender, which only passes along the input. The partials vector is going to be destroyed when this then sender completes. And that's it. We're done. This is a generic, asynchronous, parallel, inclusive scan that we can run on any schedule we want. Any questions on this? Jonathan. 
uh, what is the lambda capture for on these? So the value lambda capture here is for tile count primarily. It's also for a init, um, which we're just assuming are gonna be cheap things here that are fine for us to copy. Yeah. And I think that's the only thing that gets captured, hopefully. I could probably, if, if, if not for the fact that I wanted to keep this slide, you know, as short as possible, I would name the captures explicitly. Yeah. So bulk always sends along whatever its predecessor was without like modifying it. Oh. Yeah, that's just a little quirk of bulk. Okay. So bulk has a predecessor sender and whatever value that predecessor sends, that's what gets sent on uh, 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 by the sender that bulk returns. Alfredo. And the question is, is there something to worry about about allocating the then function? Allocating a vector in the then function? Elaborate. Ah, this then is only running on one thread. Although, talk to me later, talk to me after the talk about that for, for a slightly different world view on how that might work. But with the semantics we have today, this then runs on a single, a single thread. Okay. So we can imagine that we're going to have a whole set of asynchronous parallel algorithms based on senders and ranges. The design space for these interfaces is still pretty open. Um, it's straightforward for some common cases, like a series of four each's over the same sequence. Uh, we could imagine having an in-place transform async, which takes a sender of ranges and a callable and returns a sender of a range. And then it's easy to rewrite that series of synchronous for each's into a lazy asynchronous operation with transform async. So let's look at a slightly more interesting case, normalizing the elements of a range. So we can do this by getting the maximum element of the range and then dividing each element by that element. So this one's a bit more challenging to map to asynchronous execution. The piping syntax is great when you have a, a one dependent value that you want to pass down the chain, such as a single input sequence. But in this case, there are actually two asynchronous in inputs that we care about here. There's that input sequence, and then there's also the maximum element of that input sequence. So we may want asynchronous parallel algorithms to return richer senders. Uh, for example, the reductions like max element async should probably send both the input sequence that they were passed in as well as an iterator to the maximum element. So we're still exploring you know, what this design will look like. Um, we're not even yet the phase yet where we have proposals. Um, but I think that this is sort of the next big step after uh, senders and receivers will be figuring this out. So next, let me talk about a, a, a few uh, uh, example codes. So we've developed at NVIDIA an implementation of senders and receivers that supports both CPU schedulers, GPU schedulers, and distributed schedulers that run across multiple nodes. And one of those distributed schedulers is an MPI scheduler, as you asked about earlier, Alfredo. So this simple electromagnetic wave simulation solves Maxwell's equations on a uniform grid. This is the entire solver loop, which is expressed as a graph of senders. So this code can be run with a variety of different schedulers by changing just one line of code the kind of scheduler passed to the solver, we can go from running inline on a single CPU thread to running in parallel on the CPU using OpenMP to a single GPU to multiple GPUs within a single node to multiple nodes scaling up to thousands of GPUs. So with standard C++ senders and receivers, by just changing one line of code, you can go from uh, a single CPU thread up to a cluster of GPUs. So another really cool application that I'm very excited about is Palabos, which is a framework for parallel computational fluid dynamic simulations using the Lattice Boltzmann method. We've ported one of its applications to standard C++ senders and receivers. This simulation models carbon sequestration techniques. So the porous structure that you see here is sandstone. It's filled with saturated salt water, which is not visible on this representation. It's just sort of the background. And the red bubbles correspond to liquid CO2, 
which is injected at the bottom and travels through the sandstone because of buoyancy forces. So using our distributed GPU scheduler, we've been able to run this application at scale on up to 512 GPUs. And it looks pretty too, which, is, which always counts. So senders and receivers are the next major step in the development of C++ standard parallelism. They deliver on that second and third pillar of our plan. They give us tools to write our own parallel algorithms that can run anywhere, and they give us mechanisms for composing parallel invocations into task graphs. So following the standardization of senders and receivers, we'll want to introduce new asynchronous parallel uh, uh, sender-based versions of our algorithms. So next I want to switch focus a little bit, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, multidimensional data structures and linear algebra. So today, C++ has no reasonable abstraction for multidimensional data. There's one, but we're not going to talk about Valeray today. So this is unfortunate because many of the interesting compute-heavy uh, problems that benefit from parallelism have a multidimensional shape. But uh, the solution should be coming in C++23, and that's std MD span, uh, which is a multidimensional span type. It's very similar to the one-dimensional span introduced in C++20. So MD span is non-owning. It's just a handle to some underlying data. It doesn't manage the lifetime of that data. And that means that MD span is cheap to copy. It just contains a pointer and metadata describing the size and shape of the structure. Metadata such as the extent of a, run, of a dimension can be expressed either at runtime or compile time, allowing for metaprogramming and compile time optimizations. MD span parameterizes how a multidimensional index is mapped to a location in the underlying data. We call this parameter a layout, and it can express any kind of multidimensional structure. There are some concrete layouts in the standard library for common use cases but anyone can define their own layout and plug it into an MD span. Likewise, MD span parameterizes how it accesses the underlying data. The default is to just perform a normal C++ pointer dereference with an index. But with a custom accessor, you could instead use a special cache bypassing instruction, read from disk, or perform a remote memory access. So MD spam uses in extents objects to express the number of dimensions in a space, the rank, and their length, the extensions, the extents. Extents objects take a variadic number of integrals as template parameters. For dynamically sized extents, the magic value dynamic extent is used as a template parameter, and the extent is passed to the constructor. Through the power of C++20 class template argument deduction, when you're working with all dynamic extents, you usually don't need to spell out the entire inverse verbose instantiation. You can thank me for, for this. I wrote these deduction guides. It was not easy to make them work. There's also an alias d extents for all the dynamic ex for the all dynamic extents case. So that takes a single parameter, an integral specifying the rank. For statically sized extents, the extent itself is passed as the template argument. No corresponding constructor argument is needed. You can mix static and dynamic extents. For example, in this case, we have one static extent and one dynamic extent, so we'll need to pass just one extent at runtime. Extent objects and MD span support arbitrary rank. You can have as many dimensions as you want. So MD span itself, yeah, question. Uh, can you, back that? Yeah. you might kill me for this. But is it possible uh, to deduce which of the arguments in the CPAD form are context first and make those static extents? Um, the question is, is it possible to deduce um, in, in the, the you know, dynamic construction case, is it possible to deduce which of those arguments are context first and transform them into static extents? The answer is that unfortunately we do not because there's no notion of a context per parameter in C++ today. So we have no way of being able to tell, oh, hey, this thing that you passed into this context per function is actually a context per value. Um, so no, we do not have a way of doing that, sadly. Uh, no, we could not detect if all of them were context per. Was there another question? Yeah, go ahead. 
the, the question is, uh, does it, like, do we really need to support having static extents in the middle? Um, uh, answer, um, people tell me that they want it. Um, I think that there are some use cases for it. I think it's not as common. Keep in mind that depending on your layout, um, something that's the middle extent might actually be the first or the last one in, the, um, uh, uh, in stride order. Um, and, and so like, there may still be optimizations that you can do, even if it doesn't seem like that. Like One of the ideas of MDSpan is to separate um, uh, you know, the, the rank of a dimension from uh, any particular indexing logic. So yeah, it's not going to be the most common use case. I'll say that. David. David. David points out that there is a um, proposal for context for function parameters that he expects to get into C++ 26. It's waiting for implementation. Uh, unfortunately, because of ABI, it is unlikely that we will be able to use that in MD span. Although there's always a possibility that we could use our magical time machine to uh, backport that fix to standard libraries if they have not shipped MD span by then. But uh, don't tell any implementers that I said that. No, I guess they're recording this. So okay, all right, all right, all right. We're gonna yeah, yeah. We're we're gonna move on before I get myself into any more trouble. Yeah, Alfredo. And uh, so the question is, uh, when you call the extent member function, when you have static ones, like, like what does that do? Well, it, it, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a static or dynamic extent. When you call extent zero, it will return you the extent of the, the first um, uh, dimension. Yeah. OK. Any other questions here? Cool. So MD span is four template parameters, two of which are optional. So the first one is the element type, pretty straightforward. The second is the extents type. This must be a specialization of the extents class template. The third is the layout, and the default is layout right. We're going to discuss layouts more in a few minutes. The final parameter is an accessor, which performs the element access. And the default one is just called default accessor. I know we're great at names. So MD spans of all dynamic extents have a pretty simple syntax. With class template argument deduction, you can construct one without specifying any template parameters. Again, you can thank me for that. Took a lot of work, but those deduction guides, they're really something. So if you do need to spell out the type, it's also pretty concise. You can just use the dextents alias. Also, again, you can thank me for that one. Yeah, it's great. Nice and clean. This used to be really, really, really verbose. So the elements of an MD span are accessed via the index operator. Thanks to a recent core language change in C++23, indexing operators can now take multiple parameters. And we use that in MD span. So the, that index operator there is not a typo. That actually works in C++23. You can also make MD spans of static or mixed extents. The simplest way to construct these is by passing an extents object as the second constructor argument. And then it will C tab from there. Uh, you could also like fully spell out the types, but that is a lot. So now let's talk a little bit more about layouts themselves. The two most common layouts are layout right and layout left. With layout right, the rightmost extent is contiguous, meaning its stride is one. And strides increase from right to left as the product of extents. So this is the layout for C++ built-in arrays and for NumPy. It's also the default for MD spam. For example, if we have a two by two matrix, the two elements on the first row would have data locations zero and one. And the elements on the second row would have data locations two and three. With layout left, the leftmost extent is contiguous. Its stride is one. And the strides increase left to right as the product of extents. So this is the layout used by Fortran arrays and by MATLAB. If we had a two by two matrix in layout left, the two elements in the first column would have data locations zero and one. And the two elements in the second column would have data locations two and three. Any questions here? Yeah, Andreas. What about more crazy layouts like GPU texture? Um, GPU texture, um, data 
um, indexes or you know something like uh, uh, you know uh, Z order or Morton ordering, um, space filling curves, etc. You could definitely implement these. You can also do things like you know uh, like triangular for matrices and stuff like that. Um, you can even uh, there are proof of concepts that you could do sparse things. Um, none of those are in the standard right now, but there is, uh, there's a reference implementation. I think we have a few extended ones in the reference implementation. Don't quote me on that, but if, if we don't, perhaps we will after this, because I'll go ask somebody to implement that. Any other questions? So there is another um, standard layout uh, that allows you to explicitly specify the strides for each extent, and it is called layout stride. So this is uh, pretty useful when, like, for things like slicing, et cetera, um, uh, or if you need to do something a little quirky. So all three of the li concrete layouts in the standard library are just implementations of the layout concept. Yeah, Alfredo, question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the stride function, Alfredo's question was, isn't the whole point of uh, static strides that you know them at compile time, but uh, this stride, you know, but you have this stride member function that looks like it's runtime. Well, the stride member function is const expert, just like the extent uh, member function was const expert um, in the previous one. Now, the extent member function, uh, or is that const expert? The extent may not be const expert. Stride's definitely const expert. Let me get back to you on that. I'm fairly confident of that. Like, let's say like 90%. Um, we'll, we'll check later, and uh, we can fix it in post. <laughs> all right. So all three of the concrete layouts in the standard library are just implementations of the layout concept. So generically, a layout is just something that maps a multidimensional index to a data location. So anyone can define a layout. Um, layouts may be non-contiguous. They may map multiple indices to the same location and they may perform complicated or expensive computations. Um, they may also have or refer to state, although I don't recommend that, as that'll make your MD spans you know, expensive to copy, and they're supposed to be a cheap non-owning handle type. So parametric layout is great because it enables generic multidimensional algorithms um, that can be used with any layout. And this is an essential component of portability because different layouts might be needed on different platforms to deliver um, on performance. So t today, we have a, a major vocabulary problem with multidimensional types in the C++ ecosystem. Suppose I write a function that uses a concrete owning multidimensional type like eigenmatrix. Um, my users will be able to pass an eigenmatrix to this function, but what if they have a boost ublas matrix or a petsy matrix or a blaze matrix or a cutlass tensor or a multidimensional array passed from Fortran? That's not going to be something that they're going to be able to convert to an eigenmatrix. Now, that's where MDSpan comes in. Uh, by using it in your interfaces, your code can work with any multidimensional data structure. Because MDSpan is just this non-owning handle, and you can easily construct one that refers to an Eigen matrix, or a Boost Ublas matrix, or a Petsy matrix, or a Blot Blaze matrix, or a Cutlass tensor, an array from Fortran, a built-in C array, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just like uh, with String View or with Span, uh, this makes your interfaces more accessible because any, any owning you know, multidimensional structure uh, can be easily converted to one of these things. And I'll show you an example of that. So let's suppose that we had our own row major matrix class that I'm going to call my matrix. So all I need to do to uh, make this convertible to MD span is add a simple MD span conversion operator right here. Now, in some more complex cases, you might have to add your own layout or do something more than this. But in like a lot of the common cases, like you'll, all you'll have to do is something like this. It's like really straightforward. Yep. 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 Yeah. Um, uh, Alfredo points out that we've just taken one vocabulary problem and turned it into another vocabulary problem because there's this vocabulary of layouts. And in fact, it's very apt because we, we sort of have this challenge with the linear algebra proposal where um, essentially the Blas libraries want a slightly different shape of layout right and layout left. So we may end up with uh, different 
lay out rights and lay out lefts just for the standard blahs proposal. Um, so yeah, there's a problem here. Don't have any good solution to that. But w you, you may be correct that we may end up with a layout vocabulary problem. Yeah, Jonathan? Does the extra level of indirection here introduce any performance penalty? Does the extra level of indirection here introduce any performance penalty? It's not an extra layer of indirection because pretty much everybody's matrix types are going to just you know be a pointer to some dynamic data. And even if it's you know even if it's like a statically sized array, like that's still going to be a pointer under the hood. So there's there's no extra indirection here. David? In fact, if there's a, uh, an abstraction, like a negative penalty is faster in many cases because um, usually you would have to pass a reference to the type, which means that the size is behind a pointer, but that means you get the size of the individual type. Right? Yeah. D David points out that for an owning type, um, you'd have to pass it by reference, and the size would be you know, then behind the pointer under the hood that implements that reference, whereas with MD span, the size is in the metadata is passed by value, which can be useful for loop optimizations. All right, I'm going to move on. OK, we already looked at that example. OK, so this is a simple 3D seven-point stencil inner kernel, similar to what you'd see in a proxy application like ManyGhost. So we have two 3D MD spans here representing the problem state. And using that Cartesian product of IOTA's technique that I showed you earlier, we build a range iterating the index space. And then we use a parallel for each to, in, to iterate this space. So I like this example. I think it's a pretty, pretty nice and concise way of writing a, a stencil in C23. So if we want to change the layout, all we have to do is change the input MD spans. Everything else remains the same. So earlier, I showed you this example of a simple parallel matrix transpose. We used span and dealt with the multidimensional indexing manually. That's not particularly portable. We've hard-coded a specific data layout into our loop in that previous example, and that may not make sense in all circumstances. It's also error-prone because it's easy to make a mistake in the indexing formula. So we can improve this by using MD span instead. So now we can change the layout by simply changing the type of the MD span that we use. Now, I, I like this, um, but I want more down the road. I'd like to be able to write something like this. Now, there's three things here that we don't yet have. First, um, we don't have parallel algorithm overloads that accept ranges instead of iterator pairs. Probably get that in C++26. Next, we, we don't have this indices method here. And the idea of this indices method is that it's a method on MD span that returns a range of its multidimensional index space. Essentially, it returns a range of the, that Cartesian product of IOTAs, just so that you don't have to write it yourself. Um, and then the third thing that I'd want is a language extension to destructure, to destructure tuples in parameters, which I'm using in this lambda here. That's not real syntax right now. There is a proposal for that, but I'm not you know, super hopeful that that's going to happen. But uh, evolution people, call me up. Uh, the question was, do we have an internal implementation of that? The answer is no. And for most cases, like, if I have an implementation of something that, like, is on one of my slides, I will, be pr I will be pretty explicit and tell you about that. Yeah, no, this is slideware. Yeah, Alfredo? Um, in, in Julia, you have an indices function that takes more than one argument. Well, we don't have an indices function period right now. So this, this is just, yeah, this is, this is just future musings. And, and this would allow you to slice having an indices argument? Uh, like, what, what would those arguments be? Ah, OK, so, so, so what you want is an indices function that takes multiple arrays as the input, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting, yeah. Um, perhaps, you know, one of the problems that we have right now is that we don't have a good way, a good order, order agnostic way of expressing multidimensional indexing. Um, it's one of the, re and uh, a performant way of, of iterating multidimensional um, spaces. That's one of the reasons that MD span does not have iterators. Um, open problem, we got, uh, I, I got top people on it. OK, moving on. So going a step further, I would like you know, an asynchronous version of this, of course, that is parameterized on where it runs. Like, this is the, really the code that I would like to be able to write in the future. And again, this is, this is a 
parallel matrix transpose. I mean, this is a, like a theoretical asynchronous parallel matrix transpose that, that we'd like to have in the future. So MD span has a powerful slicing interface called sub MD span. Um, powerful interface, not so great name. It takes an MD span and returns a sliced MD span. Uh, because MD span is non owning and cheap to copy, uh, slicing it is also cheap. You're just creating a new view of the same underlying data. The input MD span is not modified. For each extent of the MD span, you pass a slice specifier to sub MD span. There are three types of these slice specifiers. The first is a single index to be selected for an extent, um, and you do this by passing an integral as the slice uh, specifier. The rank of the returned MD span will be reduced by one for each single index slice specifier. You can also pass a range of contiguous indices to be selected for an extent, and this will not reduce the rank because it's not sort of eliminating that uh, dimension. And then finally, you can pass the special magic value full extent um, to select the entire in extent, and this, again, will not um, reduce the rank. So let's look at an example. So here we have a 3D MD span, M0, and we make a slice of it by selecting eight indices for each extent, starting at indices 16, 32, and 8, respectively. The MD spans returned by sub MD span, uh, the MD span returned by sub MD span M1 is going to have a rank of 3 because we didn't use any single index slice specifier, which would have caused a rank reduction. So each of the extents of M1 will be 8. And the multidimensional indices for M1 will be offset from what they would be for M0. For example, M1000 would be equal to M01632.8. So let's look at another example, this time with rank reduction. So we'll slice M0, selecting 16 for the first extent, the entire second extent, and uh, index 32 for the uh, third extent. So this, MD, this will produce M2, uh, which will be an MD span with uh, rank 1. And the extent of that rank will be 128, the extent of the entire second dimension of M0. Uh, iterating this 1D slice will be equivalent to accessing M0 with a fixed index for the first and third extent. So sub MD span is a useful tool for writing tiled algorithms. So we're going to build a tiled version of the parallel matrix transpose that we looked at earlier. So we're going to work with square tiles with extent T by T. Uh, I think that should say N by M. Uh, yeah. OK, so first we need a range describing the set of all tiles. We'll again use a Cartesian product of iotas for this. It's OK if the tiles at the edges extend beyond the bounds of the matrices. We'll handle that in a moment. So then we have our parallel for each. This time it's going to iterate over the tiles, not all of the indices. For each tile, we're going to create new sliced MD spans for A and B using sub MD span. First, we need to determine which range of indices we need to select based on the coordinates of the tile. This is where we handle tiles that would go beyond the bounds of the matrices. We just truncate them to the end of the matrices. Now we'll pass the tuples describing the indices we want to sub MD span, producing the local, sub -M the local MD spans for this particular tile that we're all working on in this iteration. Next, we need a range of the multidimensional indices within the tile. Again, we're going to do the Cartesian product of IOTA thing. And then finally, we use a C++ range based for loop to iterate over the indices of the tile and perform the transpose with the local MD span slices that we've made. And with that, we're done. Any questions here? I know there's a lot of like spatial math happening. Cool. How would you parallelize this? Yeah, we got execution par and seek here. Um, nested par I, I recommend against nested parallelism with um, the uh, C++ 17 parallel algorithms uh, because all implementations that I know of will produce terrible, terrible performance with that. And I, David, I, do we even, I suspect that we probably fail to compile that because we don't support nested parallelism, good in nested parallelism. You won't get nested Yeah, you won't get nested parallelism. It, it, it might, it might, it might compile, but it's not going to do what you want with uh, our compiler. My experience when we're trying to compile the algorithm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so doing, doing par on the outer and unseeking the inner is probably OK. Um, yeah, that's probably fine, because that'll give you parallelism on the outside and, and uh, vectorization on the inside. So yeah, th that I would say is, is valid. All right, we're nearly at the end here, so I'm going to move on. So the set of standard C++ algorithms that we have today is, is great, but it's not complete. Um, what we primarily have is focused on manipulating one-dimensional sequences of objects. We only have a very limited set of numerical algorithms, such as reductions and scans. Um, we don't want C++ programmers writing their own versions of common numerical algorithms. Uh, we instead want them to use standard interfaces that are backed by an implementation designed and optimized for the platform that they're running on. Um, so in particular, um, the C++ committee is exploring new families of algorithms to standardize, such as linear algebra. So the C++ committee does not want to reinvent numerical linear algebra. Um, we as a committee standardize existing practice, and the existing practice for linear algebra is BLAS, the basic linear algebra subprograms. Um, so we want to standardize a modern C++ interface that can be implemented under the hood by existing optimized BLAS libraries. So the existing one-dimensional C++ algorithms uh, parameterize data with iterators, and since C++ 20 ranges. Um, for the standard C++ linear algebra algorithms, we plan to parameterize instead with MD spans. So we use the MD span parameters to express things that appeared as distinct parameters in traditional C style BLAS interfaces. For example, instead of having scaling parameters on matrix vector product, we have a scaled operation that takes a scaling factor and an MD span and returns a new MD span that will apply the scaling factor upon access. C++ standard library implementations can see through this abstraction and extract the scaling factor to feed it to a lower level BLAS interface that expects it. Another example is transposed, which returns a transposed version of the supplied MD span. As with today's C++ algorithms, we're planning to have serial and fork joint parallel overloads of linear algebra algorithms. And eventually, in the, in the future, you, you, we could imagine we'd having asynchronous uh, linear algebra algorithms. So in this example here, we, uh, we solve a, a system via upper triangular uh, Cholesky factorization. And we'd really want to chain these two operations together and launch them asynchronously. So there's plenty of other work down the road for C++ standard parallelism. Uh, there's other classes in numerical algorithms that we might want to add. There's asynchronous streams, memory model extensions, affinity and local locality facilities, et cetera. Um, but I, you know, we've, we've come pretty far, I think, in the past few years. And once we finally have senders and receivers in the standard and then uh, you know, asynchronous parallel algorithms, I think we'll really have a, a story for parallelism in standard C++ that we can uh, be proud of. So I want to I wanna end where we started um, with our goal, which is that we need to have on-ramps to parallelism in standard C++. Almost all modern platforms are parallel, yet a shocking amount of code does not take advantage of that parallelism. So we, we want to normalize parallelism in accelerated computing. Uh, writing parallel code should be easy and natural. Writing code that's going to run on a GPU should be easy and natural. And parallelism should sort of be the default way that we're thinking, instead of some exotic thing that we have to add to our program. So thank you all for your time, for your time, and I hope to see you in, uh, next year. Um, what all of this is available for us to play with today? So, um, if you want to play around with um, the C++ 17 parallel algorithms, there's a few different implementations in production. There's ours in in v C++, which supports both CPU parallelism and GPU parallelism. There's also the MSVC implementation, uh, the GCC implementation, which has been sh caveats, yeah. with caveats. Um, and that's based on TBB. Our CPU implementation uh, is based on OpenMP. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of MD span and uh, linear algebra, there's a reference implementation of those um, that is uh, available on GitHub that you can play around with. Um, we, NVIDIA, have uh, plans to productize um, uh, you know, a version of those at some point in the future. Um, stay tuned for more information on that. On the GPU, uh, of course. Um, in terms of senders and receivers, again, there's a reference implementation that's open source that's available. Um, all of the sender and receiver demos that are in this talk, uh, except for the Plabos one, I believe, are uh, there and open source and you can play around with. 
Um, and again, we have plans on productizing that and shipping it in our, uh, in our compiler um, at some point in the future. Um, so pretty much everything has some reference implementation somewhere, except for the very pie in the sky stuff, like the, uh, the we don't have any reference design for asynchronous parallel algorithms yet, um, or like any of that dot indices stuff for like multidimensional iteration uh, uh, and uh, uh, sort of order agnostic um, multidimensional iterators. So, yeah, Alfredo. Yeah. I think you and I should probably talk about this later because I'm not sure that I am fully understanding the problem here. But I think we should probably chat about this later. Yeah, the, the iteration problem is um, is real, and so I, I will briefly explain why. I'll briefly explain why MD Span doesn't have multidimensional iterators. Um, so your compiler um, uh, knows how to sniff out a for loop. Um, like it, it, it does this thing where it transforms code in such a way that eventually loops appear in some canonical form. Um, and then the compiler's like, hey, that's a loop. I know what to do with loops. Um, but usually at like that, that stage of compilation, there's no language level constructs like you know, a for loop. It's just like a series of like IR instructions. But the compiler knows what those look like. Um, for loops that were lowered from typical language for loops. Now a multidimensional iterator, um, it essentially has the logic of a loop embedded into its operations. Um, you know, like some of the bounds checks are going to be done in the increment um, operation or the decrement op uh, operation um, uh, or the dereference operation. Um, and because of that, because like the, you've sort of hidden a for loop inside of this library construct, the compiler doesn't know that that's a for loop. And it doesn't know how to treat it like a for loop. And so when the, you have a, a linear, you know, one dimensional for loop, over multidimensional iterators, what the compiler sees is a linear for loop with a bunch of really confusing control flow logic that doesn't know how to optimize. And that just immediately shuts off vectorization. And so because of that, because of our inability to write a multidimensional iterator that the compiler can like understand and optimize, we decided to leave multidimensional iterators out of MDSpan. The other problem is that if we included multidimensional iterators, we would have had to pick a particular direction. Now, one-dimensional iterators, you've got two directions. You either go forward or you go backwards. OK, you could probably pick other directions, but those are the two like <laughs> reasonable directions, let's say. Um, in multi-dimensional world, there's not really you know, one clear forward direction. And so we'd need some way to parameterize that. Yeah, Michael, you better tell me how we can teach compilers to make um, multi-dimensional iterators good. So yes, my idea, my very brilliant and clever idea was <laughs> was to create such an iterator from a coroutine. So the idea is that you'd have a, a nested for loop and you would yield out of it. And then when the compiler um, like elides and inlines the, the coroutine from that generator, it would essentially drop those for loops in place. And then it would be like, hey, these are for loops that I know about, instead of like handwritten you know, library iterator things, and to be able to recognize them and vectorize them. I had some luck with this approach, but I was not able to generalize it. So if, if you had like t a depth of like, t if you manually unrolled the for loop, you'd be fine. But if you wanted to make it an arbitrary depth, then you needed to have recursive coroutines. And compilers today, or at least when I tried, crap, it would have wow. been 2017. When I tried back in 2017, um, compilers would not do the coroutine el elision and, uh, and uh, 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 optimizations uh, in the case where you had these like recursive uh, uh, coroutine uh, generators. So, oh, cool. We should definitely. Yeah.
we should definitely talk later. I do, I do think that this is a like this is a potential route. However, I would be hesitant about multi-dimensional iterators that depend solely on on like the optimization of coroutine mechanics. What I think would be a much better route would be for us to figure out some set of intrinsics that we could implement in a compiler that a multi-dimensional iterator could use to explain to the compiler, here's what I'm doing, please optimize accordingly. That is like on my to-do list though, but there's a lot of things in my to-do list, so maybe I'll find some helpless intern to unload that one on. All right, one more question, then uh, Bryce needs water. Okay, thank you all. See y'all around.